I'm filling in for somebody, so I'm trying to bring in the spirit of those who've gone before me, but also bring my own perspective to it. So if you've ever seen Ted Miguel give this talk uh, on pre-analysis plans or pre-registration, there's going to be some overlap. Uh, and obviously, you know, Ted has been working a lot in, in the area of thinking about how should we do pre-registration and pre-analysis plans and a lot of what I think is uh, intellectually inherited from Ted. But I do bring my own perspective to it as somebody who primarily does um, meta-analytic work or evidence aggregation. So initially, you know, you might think, how on earth are you going to pre-register uh, something where original studies with this data have already been published? Um, and so obviously what it means to pre-register a meta-analysis or a trial um, you know, of something where we already have very strong ideas about what the data will contain or we actually have looked at the data already is going to be different. Um, but I think that there are, are, I still think that there are benefits to writing uh, pre-registrations and uploading them publicly. And we're going to go in a little bit to like why I think that is kind of more in the second half of this uh, presentation. Um, but I'll flag it in the beginning because that's really my perspective and my background. Um, but of course, so feel free to interrupt with questions throughout. Uh, we have an hour and a half and I actually thought we only had an hour, so we've got lots of time for questions, so that's, that's excellent. So we often think of pre-registration and pre-analysis plans as something that you do before you open uh, your data file. And in a lot of classical settings, that would be true. Uh, so if you're running an experiment or if you're collecting new data, then you really want to start thinking about this before you even open the data file. Um, that's not always possible, and indeed there's going to be aspects of uh, the data that you might want to see before you actually write the pre-analysis plan. But certainly before you start writing code that analyzes the data, you want to be writing a pre-registration or a pre-analysis plan if that makes sense in your context. That's sort of the perspective that, that we kind of take at BITS um, and, that, and that I take. It is not an uncontroversial perspective, and throughout the talk, I'm going to flag why that might be controversial or where there's going to be areas you can run into trouble with both of these types of, of plans. So before we go into that, let's just talk a little bit about, and I'm, I'm sure you've covered this, why we might want to do pre-registration or pre-analysis plans. So there's obviously lots of problems with empirical social science research. Um, we know that it's very likely that our literatures are distorted by false positive results. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for data mining in empirical social science. Um, and I want to flag here something that I will talk about later, which is Data mining doesn't necessarily have to be malicious, and it's not necessarily the case that a researcher goes in with bad intentions and says, I'm going to find a story here, or that they even do something as obvious as, like, I'm running 400 regressions and I found two that are exciting, and let me write a paper about that. Although people do do that and don't realize that it's wrong. Um, you know, it can be as simple as, well, I sort of was thinking about this question, and then when I ran the analysis, it was really noisy. So then I started thinking, couldn't I better measure it with something else? And then I kept kind of looking and looking until I found something that wasn't noisy. And then I, you know, so that doesn't seem bad to a lot of people. But, and it's not necessarily bad. It's just exploratory work, data mining in the sense that people in machine learning would think about it. It is bad if you then do null hypothesis significance testing on top of that and claim you're doing confirmatory data analysis. And we do, I think, have a serious problem with that in economics, where people are not making a distinction, and probably more broadly, although let me just speak about the sins of my own profession, people don't make a distinction between those two kinds of analysis. And there's also the file drawer problem, right? So people, if, if they can't find anything that's not noisily measured, uh, then they'll just throw it away or, or say it's not a priority, I can't get this published in a good journal. That's very real, that's not malicious, that's just people saying, I want to you know, continue to be able to do my important research and I have to focus on getting published so that I can have a job. Uh, <laughs> so that's a profession-wide problem. Um, and, and I'm kind of emphasizing here that you know, there's ways in which these three problems can arise from malicious intent, but there's also ways that they can arise from people with having good intentions. Um, and I think that pre-registration and pre-analysis plans are useful for both types of people or, or a system in which we've got both types of problems occurring there. Um, so we know that there are these problems and we've got nice tools for diagnosing and quantifying these problems. Um, the P-curve paper is the classical paper. Um, Isaiah Andrews and Max Casey have just released a new paper on diagnosing uh, sort of publication bias and that sort of stuff within a meta-analytic context, um, which is really exciting to have these kind of high-powered econometricians finally looking at a problem that we would really care about. 
Um, but I think for most of us, when we come to doing social science ourselves, what we ask ourselves is, if we're in the kind of category where we're well-intentioned, like how do I avoid becoming a statistic? How do I avoid becoming part of this problem? Um, and so there are a couple of solutions, and this is uh, Ted and his co-authors have kind of laid out three interrelated approaches to begin addressing those broad sets of problems that I was talking about. So one's obviously just disclosure of, of what you're doing, and I think closely related to that is making your data and materials openly accessible and making your procedure you know, transparent. I see one and two as being very, very closely related. Um, because with two, you can actually, someone can actually verify that what you disclosed is, is accurate, is correct. Um, now, again, we want to flag, you can't necessarily always verify that the claims disclosed by authors are correct and that the data shared is complete. Um, later in the talk, I can discuss a little bit more, but as somebody who works with data sets that other researchers have already compiled, sometimes you can see fingerprints in the data set that the data set is not complete. Um, and there's unfortunately not a heck of a lot you can do about it except to like moderate your own expectation about what it is that you're producing and kind of be cautious, therefore, when you know that maybe you're not getting the complete data set. Um, you know, so, so uh, if, if, you're, if people are engaging maliciously with step one and two, there's not a, a heck of a lot we can do about it. You can look for it, um, and I'll talk about that later, but, you know, that's kind of challenging. What's nice about the third uh, strategy that they recommend, which is the subject of today's talk, is that pre-registration of research hypotheses actually can catch malicious researchers who are thinking, like, I just want to get published and that's all I care about, or, you know, I just want to find that tobacco doesn't cause smoking or whatever, or it doesn't cause cancer or something like that. Um, probably does cause smoking, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, you know, so in that case, what are we asking people to do? Well, we want them to share their research design and plans before, um, before they actually get the data, ideally, right? So, and we want to have some kind of verified mechanism by which we know that they don't have the data yet, either because, you know, there's just no way they could collect it yet, or the intervention hasn't been done yet, or they don't have approval for it yet. Um, and this makes the other two approaches much more useful, because then I know that when I'm replicating what you've done, you know, I'm really replicating something that you've always intended to do. Right? If you specification search and then you give me the data set and I run the final regression that you found that was great, I will get the same result. Right? I will replicate what you did. Only something like a pre-analysis plan is going to tell me, no, that wasn't your original hypothesis. You're not doing confirmatory data analysis. Um, there's also a range of other potential benefits, and we'll talk about that uh, throughout the rest of the talk. Okay, so I think the first question is, well, why would you pre-specify research hypotheses, but I think even before that, so when Ted always gives this uh, pitch, he always says, why would you do it? And I think you always have to step back and say, well, what are we actually talking about? Because there's a lot of potential things that could come under this heading, and I think it can be confusing for people. And this is the source of the confusion where people then say, but it's too much work, or it's unrealistic, or it stifles my you know, creative process as a researcher, and, and we're going to go through all of that. Okay, so what, do, what, what are we talking about? We're talking about a researcher posting their research hypotheses, um, the data that they're going to use to test them, uh, whether or not they already have that data. Hopefully they don't have it yet. Sometimes it's unavoidable, as in my case, when I'm doing meta-analysis. And the research design, so the methodology, um, and that can be of varying levels of detail, right? So you could just say, I'm going to run a bunch of linear regressions, um, and then uh, as a robustness check, I'm going to include higher order terms in my linear regressions. Or you could go so far as to actually write down the models that you're going to fit and even write down dummy analysis code that you're running on fake data. Um, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of different um, options. This planned research design uh, area gets more complicated when you're doing innovative methodological work. So that's my sort of... And if you go and read my pre-analysis or my pre-registrations online, you'll see that I sort of say, I'm going to develop a methodology. It should have these criteria or these qualities, but we don't know what that's going to look like in the end because we don't have that methodology yet. Um, but it's still valuable to pre-register. Like, these were the criteria that I was searching for in the methodology that I ended up with. Um, you know, so, oh, it should have the right support on the parameter space or, or something, you know, like that. And that should be posted in a publicly available registry that's sort of frozen after you post it, right? So the open science framework will do that, right? Like once you post it, you can't edit it. Uh, you know, it's locked down from you. The AEA trials registry is the same. Um, 
So as we've been talking about, there's a wide range of detail that you could potentially include. Um, you know, clinicaltrials.gov, the ADA registry, these allow you to include relatively sparse information. Um, I think that is still valuable for some of the reasons we'll talk about later. Um, and so it's not the case that when we say pre-registration, we expect you to have written dummy analysis code that you've run on fake simulated data, right? That's just not at all the level of effort that we're talking about. Um, because there's going to be many cases where the problems that we're analyzing are not well understood enough that you could possibly know that level of detail beforehand. But you probably know what outcomes you're interested in and what broad kind of methodology you're going to use, right? Like if I say I'm doing Bayesian analysis and then I produce like a frequentist paper, then it's like pretty clear that something happened there that I should be disclosing. And even that level of abstraction is like important for us to kind of get on the record and have this sort of paper trail. So since uh, the AEA is kind of the big one in my field um, and maybe I hope relevant to many of you, um, I want to go through in a little bit more detail, although it is very similar uh, in some sense to the Open Science Framework one as well, so I think this is just a good general kind of uh, framework. Okay, so the AEA registry is a general social science registry, and uh, it was founded in May of 2013 with a focus on randomized controlled trials. Um, so this would really be a case where you're about to do an experiment. So let alone, like, it's not that you haven't collected the data yet, you have it, but you also haven't even done the thing you're wanting to collect data about yet. So you really are like, very, very far from being able to contaminate the data at this stage because it doesn't exist yet. Um, so if you go there, and the, this I think is from Ted's computer because I'm not like responsible enough to only have seven tabs or something. I always have like 500 tabs and then wonder why the computer is slow. Uh, so this is what you see if you go there. Um, and it just kind of says, okay, so randomized trials are, are an important uh, tool in social science. Um, and we know that these are areas where we are particularly susceptible to things like the file drawer problem. Um, because randomized trials often come about when there's observational evidence or you know, correlational evidence that something maybe is associated with something else, but then when you do a randomized trial, I mean, often what we found in the last 10 or 15 years is that the causal story is really hard to pin down. So the effect is usually not as big as the correlation kind of suggests, and in that case, maybe your power calculations were kind of off, and therefore you actually didn't detect anything, and then you can't really, you know, it's hard to get it published in Econometrica, and so you might just bump that down your priority list. Um, and so I think, having spoken with Esther Duflo about this, like, the file drawer problem was her main concern when she was pushing for something like this, um, but of course, this is related to more more sort of broad uh, concerns, and it's not at all, you don't have to be a member of the AEA to use this, um, you know, registration is free, you can register like any new study at its outset. Um, you can also register past studies, uh, you know, when you're at some intermediate stage there, it was ideal that you register it first, but for reasons I'll go into later, it's not useless to register them later, I, I think there's, there's benefit to that. Um, another nice thing that's kind of flagged here is, um, you can actually search the registry for projects that are in progress. So that helps researchers to avoid duplication of effort. And you know, it, it may not seem that that's related to specification searching, but in practice, and, and I'm not sure how many of you have kind of uh, witnessed yourself doing this, but when you are working on a project and you find out that another researcher is working on a similar project, you immediately start like searching your own project and saying, like, what's different? What can I emphasize that's different? Where that's a kind of p hacking, right? Like, what kind of, what's something else that, like, what makes me special? And it's like, that wasn't the goal of the study initially. I was just trying to find out the elasticity of this number. Now I found out that Raj Chetty is also researching the elasticity of the number. Now I have to find something different. That's searching. Uh, so that's not ideal either. Uh, and just being able to look beforehand is going to be really helpful in terms of saying, well, let me at the outset kind of find a question that I'll be happy to stick by regardless of what happens. Um, now, of course, you know, there's still going to be cases where, you know, Raj doesn't register his observational studies and then I'm in this situation where, I, you know, I can't compete with him, but at least if I had a pre-registration plan, I'd be able to say, you know, initially, this is what I was looking for. In the interim, other research came out that suggested the answer to that question was this. Now my research is going to be like a test of that in a different sample, and I'm going to additionally do some exploratory work. So, you know, it just allows you to contextualize what you're doing in a, in a better and more accurate way for other scholars. 
So that's also clearly kind of noted on the registry. And then you just click here and you can register a trial. Um, so since its inception, over 1,200 studies have been registered. The numbers are increasing rapidly. Um, some of these are earlier projects that are being registered for completeness. Now, uh, this could be cases where someone's already done the experiment and collected the data, but they haven't analyzed it, or they haven't analyzed the last wave of the data yet. Um, but most of the things that are registered are new studies. So this is just, I think, very nice. So we can sort of see that the trend here is, uh, is beautiful, non-linear, for those of you who love linear regression. Sometimes it's not going to cut it. Uh, so we've got a beautiful trend here. I think it really is gaining kind of steam in social science. I think this is noise. It's, it's going to go up. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there is, there, I think, you know, it, it's po of course it's possible that this is noise, right? It's also possible that it reflects a little bit more of the controversy about pre-analysis plans. You know, with, with one data point, I can't really tell, so we're going to have to see what happens this year. Um, but yeah, so, so this is something that fortunately is becoming more and more prevalent in social science in general, in economics. People, if, if they're not writing pre-analysis plans and, re -register, and registering their studies, they're being forced to explain why they're not doing that. Um, and at least that is valuable. Okay, so what's actually required on the AEA site? So you need to give the title for your trial. That is, I mean, you know, it's a, it can be a working title. No one is requiring that you then write the paper that has that title. Um, the status of the trial, so you need to disclose, are you registering it before you even do the experiment? Or, you know, in my case, I mean, I wouldn't register a meta-analysis on the AEA, but on the OSF I could register, like, I already have the data. And in fact, for the project that I did for BITS, I had already done an analysis of the average treatment effects. What I had not done was an analysis of the heterogeneity. It was still valuable for me to sort of go in there and, and, and have in the introduction paragraph of my pre-registration, here's the analysis I did of the average effects. Now I'm going to try to analyze the heterogeneous treatment effects. Even at that point, there's a huge, what Andrew Gelman calls, garden of forking paths, right? As soon as you start looking at something more detailed, more complex, there's many, many ways that you could try to look at it. So even at that stage, it's really valuable, even just for yourself as a researcher, to say, this is what I'm planning to do. Now, that, that's a case where someone malicious cannot be caught, right? Like, for, if I was malicious, I could have already done the analysis and then said, oh, I always plan to do this. But if you're not malicious and you're just trying to prevent yourself from accidentally you know, running into these problems or convincing yourself ex post that you always intended to look at this, then it is really valuable as long as you're honest about the status um, going in. So you want to put keywords just so other people can search the trial registry. Um, an abstract. So this is not, this does not have to be like a dummy abstract of like what your paper will say. It's an abstract of the plan. Uh, so it sort of just gives a brief overview of what's, what's happening, what you're planning to do, the broad methodology you're going to use. Um, if you're you know, doing an RCT or some other kind of experiment, your trial start date, your intervention start date, your intervention end date, your trial end date, um, the outcomes that you're interested in and you know, when are you measuring them and what are they. So this to me is like the key really, really key thing, because searching over outcomes is something that well-intentioned researchers do all the time, um, because it, it is often the case that things that we measure are way more noisy than we thought they would be. Um, you know, sometimes when you sort of look at outcomes for, say, profit in businesses that are run by people in rural areas in, say, India, you sort of look at it and you're thinking, am I getting any signal at all? Is this just noise? It's very hard to measure profit. Uh, people don't necessarily compute profit in the way that the researcher is imagining that profit is computed and, you know, each individual business owner is thinking about profit in a different way. Is he putting his labor costs into the costs or not? You know, so it is really easy to get to the end of a trial and then say, oh, this was my key outcome, but actually, you know, no, 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 it's not suitable. I'm going to use a different outcome. And sometimes that makes sense, but sometimes that's just searching. Uh, and so in order for us to know, you know, when it makes sense or not, we all need to know what situation you're in. And so you need to explain it to us. And only by having pre-analysis plans where people have to specify what the outcomes were in the beginning can we make sure that that conversation happens. So I think that's very valuable. This also comes up in meta-analyses. When you're doing meta-analysis, you have to choose which outcomes you're going to do analysis on. Um, and there's absolutely issues there as well. 
and um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, the experimental design as well is super valuable if you're doing an experiment. Um, I think of this uh, as being analogous to like methodological design. If what you're trying to do is say, you know, suppose that what you're interested in is constructing a better index to measure something. Right? Then like, what you would do is you'd say, I'm going to specify the broad principles by which I would be determining, you know, is this index good or not, or how will I build it? Right? So you're kind of writing um, what, what programmers call pseudocode for yourself. So you're saying, I'm going to do kind of this broad step, this broad set of steps of things. And now everybody knows what I'm planning to do. If you, know, if you have a lot of design details already specified, you can include that, you know, clustering of treatment, plan number of clusters. Plan number of reservations, IRB approval, you know, this is like optional. If you don't know already what you're going to do, you don't have to put it in. You know, if it's not relevant to your study, you don't have to put it in. IRB approval, they always make you say either I have it or I don't need it, which seems reasonable. So, okay. So this is my sort of little uh, thing that I was flagging. Uh, you can pre-register non-RCT studies. The o OSF makes it easier. So Bits is heavily involved with the OSF. The OSF makes it much easier because they almost have a free form. Like there's very few required fields. And then you're encouraged to submit a report uh, that's just your pre-registration report that takes any form that you say that it should take. Um, I pre-registered my meta-analyses. Uh, and in particular, what was really important to me was to pre-register the outcomes that I was interested in. Um, because it does happen that when you don't find anything interesting, I've even had in seminars Senior economists say to me, you know, your work is really interesting, but it's really a shame that you didn't find any, like, statistically significant, you know, effect of microcredit. Have you thought about looking at other outcomes? Like, maybe you're just missing something. Uh, and the answer is, I decided when I was trying to think about what are the likely variables that measure the impact of microcredit, that these six variables were the most important. And... You know, I, I held myself to that by writing a pre-analysis plan or pre-registration plan. And it would be p-hacking, even in a Bayesian framework, for me to go through. So p-hacking, I think, you know, is most serious in a frequentist framework when you're trying to claim that you're not doing things conditional on the data, right? You're doing this repeated analysis. In a Bayesian framework, it's, it's less serious because Bayesian statistics is always just conditional on the data I have. However... There are subtle differences in the likelihood that you should be using if, in fact, your plan was, if I don't infer that this beta is larger than this number, then I'm going to actually do additional analyses, right? So the actual likelihood that you should be using is different in your Bayesian analysis. So it's not that Bayesians kind of get off scot-free from p-hacking. It's still the case that if I just go sequentially and start looking at different stuff, the likelihood that I'm using actually changes, and I should change it. Um, it's very unconventional to pre-register a meta-analysis uh, or any kind of trial where you already have the data. Um, and in fact, when you've already written one paper with the data, <laughs> it's very unconventional. And in fact, you know, you may not even get to mention it in the paper that you eventually write. I certainly, I think it's in a footnote in my papers um, because it's controversial, right? And I think the reason why it's controversial is because people think about pre-analysis plans through the lens of preventing malicious behavior preventing research or fraud that's intentional. What they don't think about, but what, which I think is really equally important, is preventing well-intentioned researchers from unintentionally searching over specifications or convincing themselves ex post that actually they made a mistake when they made the initial you know, plan of what they were going to look at. And actually, it was really dumb that I didn't think of looking at schooling for the children and the microcredit. And like, maybe it was dumb, right? But it matters that you know, I wouldn't go back and look for it if I found big effects on these other variables, right? So that puts it in a different position in, in the likelihood in a technical sense. So it stops you as a well-intentioned researcher from just searching over outcomes for interesting results. It stops you from searching over models for interesting results, right? It's equally easy to tell yourself, actually pre-specified the wrong model. And there are cases where you pre-specify a model and then you look at the data and you see this model doesn't fit the data at all, right? So uh, Ted and his projects on uh, electricity in Kenya these are fantastic projects and, and really kind of move the needle on how we think about uh, electricity markets in developing countries. And yet when they pre-registered, they were very, very specific. And they said that they were going to include, they were going to log something and then they were going to include a square of something. And that shape of the function just absolutely did not fit the data. So when you graph it against the scatter plot, it was just obviously the wrong functional form choice. There is no way to know that 
and like before you get the data. So you're gonna make mistakes like that sometimes. Um, but it kind of forces you, if you've got a pre-registration, to say, okay, my prior about what the functional form was is wrong. Uh, and when Ted shows those results, he shows the graph with the functional form that they pre-specified, and then he shows the graph with the functional form that clearly fits much better. So then you're sort of in this murky area where you're saying, well, what should I make of that? And if you're, you know, I think approaching this with appropriate caution, you say, okay, you know, we learned a lot about functional form <laughs> from this analysis, and we would never learn that if Ted was just allowed to say, oh, that's just a mistake, I'll put it in a footnote, right? So, you know, the cultural biases that we have about what kind of information we'd like to learn have to be thrown out the window when we're pre-specifying, you know, our plans that include kind of these priors. Um, it's very, it, it's so easy, you know, and I'm sure you guys have all had this experience, uh, if you're kind of paying enough attention to yourself when you're doing analysis, to just sort of say, oh, but, uh, you know, I see in the scatter plot that it looks different. You say, okay, that's fine, but now you're doing exploratory analysis. And, like, be, let's be clear with people what we're doing. Um, the third thing that it stops you from doing is silently reorienting your study once your results fail to confirm your, confirm your hypothesis, but you find some new, cool, interesting hypothesis. Uh, that is really subtle, right? It is very subtle, and, you know, I don't even know of, like, the formal statistical expression of exactly how that changes the likelihood. You know, I'm sure that Isaiah and Max are, are working on that as we speak. Um, but it is really natural for us to do that. And I think one way that you find that popping up is whenever people release a study, they, you know, you'll get this chorus of like, but we knew that, but we knew that. Uh, and it's really frustrating because actually typically we don't know that. We just have this incredible hindsight bias where like I convince myself that whatever I see is what I expected to see in the first place. So if only for preventing us from falling victim to hindsight bias in our own projects, it's really valuable to specify, you know, I'm going to run this model because this is how I think the data is generated and I think this is the shape of the functional form. So these are all things that would benefit a well-intentioned researcher who wants to be better. Uh, and I think there is value in that. I've certainly benefited from that, even in this kind of unconventional setting where I've pre-registered a meta-analysis. Yes? As you kind of become a researcher, is there a cost to getting your pre-registration on? Like, is there a cost to credibility that, like, oh, uh, I got the functional form, I'm going to uh, talk about the new functional form? Uh, so, uh, I've seen Ted present uh, his, the electricity work that I, that I mentioned at MIT, and no one batted an eye. Everyone thought, okay, this makes sense. It's great that you pre-registered. You know, you, there's, there's still this kind of sense that like pre-registering is a really great thing to do. And so we don't penalize people for pre-registering something that in retrospect turns out to be wrong or, or a, a bad idea given what the shape of the data actually is. Um, so I think people at the moment are very forgiving. Um, and I think that kind of speaks to actually what people are concerned about is they, I think the problem we have is the opposite where uh, people are afraid that they'll be punished, and therefore they don't want to do a, a pre-analysis plan. Um, and so, you know, I can assure you in my experience, people are not being punished as long as they're being honest, and I've never seen somebody not be honest because it's so easy to check, and also because people who care about this tend to want to be doing the right thing. So, you know, that's also the sense in which it's great to kind of have tools that help us do the right thing better. Yeah? Okay, so how then to find that balance between being um, biased in hindsight and then being so restrictive that you're really actually um, imprisoned in some sort of, you know, like, an, um, uh, you know, some specific techniques or some specific methodology that you have to use because you pre-registered. And then you just like, okay, you, you're done with this research, and then you start another one that actually answers the more interesting question that you found out, or how do you, how do you work? So that? what I think is reasonable, um, and what certainly um, Tad has, has done, uh, is you can either go through, kind of write the paper as you always would have written it, mm -hmm. and where you need to deviate from the pre-registration for whatever reason, mm -hmm. uh, you just flag it, and you always show the analysis with the pre-registered pre methodology, but then you need to make a compelling argument to your reader why that no longer seems valid, given what you now know. Another option would be to write the paper in a slightly different way and to say, here, you know, section one is my confirmatory data analysis. I'm just in the box that I promised I would be in. 
actually, we learned a heck of a lot more than we thought we would, and things looked very different. And so here's section two of the paper, which is all of, you know, what I would have done in the days before there were pre-analysis plans, which is start kind of looking through the data and, like, you know, kind of looking at it from multiple angles and turning it upside down and then trying to figure out what actually fits the data well. But then everybody knows that what you're doing is exploratory. So I think, and Andrew Gelman, I think, has, has uh, on several occasions, sort of just suggested you should write papers with two sections, the confirmatory section and the exploratory section. Yeah. Um, that seems very kind of applicable when you've got a case of, you know, there's a trial, you didn't have the data, you had some idea about what you were going to do, then you do it, and then you got, you know, a new idea based on what you saw. It's harder to see when you're doing things like meta analysis when you're pre-registering, you know, uh, your broad plan for how you're going to do the analysis, how you would do that second structure. And in that case, I think we go with kind of the TED style structure where you just say, you know, I'm going to do this kind of analysis. As a footnote, I actually plan to do something different. Let me try to convince you why, you know, I actually have to do what I'm doing now. Uh, and so just to kind of have that conversation with people. So that's my personal approach, and, and I think it's worked well for the people who've, who've tried it. It isn't necessarily widely adopted, um, and so I think kind of that's something that we're figuring out together as a community. But absolutely, I think just being honest, being upfront, um, that doesn't mean like falling on your sword and making the whole paper about how you were an idiot who didn't know the functional <laughs> form. Like, <laughs> Uh, you know, there's, there's no reason to kind of go that far and then sort of say like, oh my God, I didn't learn anything or because I was so wrong. Like, you know, I think you can always sort of put your best foot forward in terms of what did we learn, but just be really honest with people about how you learned it. And so I think that's the answer. Yeah. Um, okay, so now that we've figured out what pre-registration is, why would we do it? Okay, so uh, some kind of benefits of pre-registration that I haven't talked about, although I've talked about a bunch of others, is that um, when you pre-register a plan, you kind of round out the body of evidence and you create a paper trail of these unpublished stories or potentially stories, uh, uh, studies that get altered uh, in the process of publication. Um, and that is potentially going to help us address publication bias. Um, and there's lots of work on that. It also helps us improve meta-analysis, right? It would be really fantastic if I, as a meta-analyst, knew that there were four trials of microcredit that didn't work for some reason, right, by some criterion. Maybe you, they couldn't actually roll out the microcredit branch the way that, the branches the way they wanted to. That would really help me as a meta-analyst when I'm trying to answer the question, like, if I broadly subsidize microcredit across, like, you know, 100 different countries, what's likely to happen? Right? Because those failed trials, if they existed, to my knowledge they don't exist, um, would tell me that information. Uh, in the microcredit literature that I work in, I'm less worried about this because uh, as far as I know, those trials are pre-registered and, and you know, all published, but also they were published with null results, essentially. So there is, you know, there are stories of publication bias where only things with null results get published. I don't think that's the world that we are living in. So when I see a null result, I think, you know, that's probably an accurate reflection of the draw that the researchers got. Um, you know, again, that's just based on the reading of how publication works in economics. It could be different in different literatures. So, again, as I've been saying, you know, the pre-registration plan really reduces the risk of data mining in an undisclosed way. Uh, it also reduces this uh, kind of shining a certain light on results that only occurs to me after I do the trial. Uh, which can be really subconscious. So that kind of cherry picking is not just malicious, it really can be subconscious. And at least when you write a pre-registration, you're forced to confront yourself. It's clear what your original intentions were and what your hypotheses actually were. Uh, so for the frequentists in the audience, which is probably most of you, uh, this is super crucial because this is what generates correctly sized statistical tests. Right? So p-values and the way that you compute them and the way that you compute size completely depend on how you ran the experiment. It's not just conditional on the data that you have. Uh, because frequentist econometrics does not condition on the data, it's a pre-data procedure that aims to be correct over multiple random draws from data sets. You really need to nail the procedure down exactly right in order to compute the p-values and to compute the tests exactly right. Um, I still think as a Bayesian that it's good for me to kind of do this stuff uh, because of all the reasons I already mentioned, but also because Andrew Gelman has this paper where he says that multi-level modeling, which is primarily a Bayesian uh, approach, although it can be done in a frequentist way, 
um, is going to prevent us from doing the sort of cherry picking and multiple testing because you just build this massive model that contains all of these hypotheses. Uh, and then the model itself will select, you know, based on the understanding that it has to do inference across this huge set, which ones are actually important or, or which parameters there's actually evidence for being, you know, precisely understood in a certain way. Uh, that requires you to build that massive model. And in practice, you're not going to do that. You're going to run into computational issues. So it's, it's fine for like certain things and it's fine for, you know, if I had six variables that I'm interested in, there's cases where I could build, you know, a big model that deals with all six outcomes. It absolutely is going to deal with the problem where you start slicing up the interactions, right? So within one regression, if I start cutting the treatment with like a lot of dummy variables because maybe it works for men who are over 60 or women who are under 25 or something like that, um, you know, that is taking care of an invasion framework. And the reason that's taking care of is because all Bayesian inference is joint inference. Uh, and if you want to do individual inference, you have to marginalize it out. Frequentist inference is not like that. Um, but broader kinds of cherry picking are absolutely not taken care of, right? I did Bayesian analysis on six outcomes. If I picked a seventh outcome and just threw it in because it didn't find anything exciting on my six outcomes, that is searching and nothing Bayesian is going to protect me from that. Uh, so there's an inherent problem with that that pre-analysis plans help us solve. It really makes clear what additional tests are run beyond those originally planned. And that makes multiple testing adjustments more credible for frequentists. Um, but it also makes, you know, Bayesian analysis kind of more credible as well. We can appropriately contextualize what's happening. Uh, you know, Bayesian analysis is conditional on the data, but if you're adding more variables, you're adding more data. So now you're conditioning on different data. So the problem remains. The fourth, uh, the fourth kind of point that people sort of, uh, I think, maybe underrate a little bit is that it does make the first two points that, we, that were discussed in Ted's paper on how to solve these general problems in social science way more effective, right? So replication, the data that you're giving me, it's way more effective if I see the pre-analysis plan that sort of says what data you plan to collect. Um, so it allows other scholars to cross-check the published information against the original research plans. This actually turned out to be very important for me when I was doing meta-analysis. Because I found that, uh, you know, some researchers, when they upload kind of the data that they have to public registries, will upload versions of the data that have already been heavily modulated by the statistical analysis. Um, so, you know, you might find if you look at the survey or you look at the pre-analysis plan, you know, we're going to collect these, you know, 25 indicators on this, you know, on, on income because it's really hard to measure income. So we've got 25 different ways to measure it. Um, and then when you open the data set that they've uploaded, you only see the composite. You don't see the original 25 measures, right? So that already will tell you something like, okay, right? And this can occur just well-intentioned, right? The researcher tells the RA, upload the data. The RA says, okay, whatever is the file that came out of the last round of what we were analyzing, that's what I'll upload. Um, but, you know, without a pre-analysis plan, there's no way for us to say, wait, they didn't collect a, like, it's not that they got the surveyors to construct a composite. They constructed the composite after they saw the 25 variables. There are cases even, I've seen uploaded data sets where, uh, I don't know how much you guys use data. I'm not super familiar with data, but I do know that when you do fixed effects regression in data, data will generate the fixed effects as variables. Uh, and I have seen uploaded data sets from trials where the DTA file includes the fixed effects that were generated by Stata. So you know that you're seeing a post-process file. Uh, so there's ways like that that you can sort of tell what you're seeing, but it's much easier with a pre-analysis plan, right? And that really helps us kind of build more trust and credibility with each other. I can tell who's kind of, you know, disclosing and giving me the raw data or data that's cleaned in a certain way and then uploading the cleaning file or something like that versus not. As a side benefit, I think it forces all of us to more carefully think through our hypotheses before we actually do the trial. Uh, and sort of, you know, it kind of leads us to think, well, if I find this, what am I going to do? What am I going to think? And so I get a clearer understanding of my own process as a researcher. And that's really important when there's researcher degrees of freedom, right? So then I can correct for what I'm doing rather than just kind of considering myself this objective arbiter of the truth, whereas, of course, I'm not objective. I come into the process with priors. That's always how research works. That's what makes exploratory research so effective. 
but it's what makes you know frequent test sizes wrong when you don't adjust for that. So you know we want the best of both worlds. And one way that we can kind of get a bit closer is to think more seriously beforehand, what will I do if I find this? How will I adjust for that? Um, and that is going to reduce the waste of funding on poorly conceived projects that, you know, we're only ever going to produce, you know, something that we already knew or something that, you know, was going to be so noisily measured that there was absolutely no way we were going to learn something from it. Okay, so these were the sort of five reasons that uh, we often think of. Is there any other kind of plug people want to make for pre-analysis plans? Uh, in terms of number five, uh, does it become with a new kind of fancy machine learning neural network methods that kind of like choose why to do the best model? So there's some, there's, there's going to be some elements of it where you can say, well, I'm just going to use an ensemble like this method of boosted trees, and therefore I'm not going to have to choose the specification ex ante. You are, however, going to have to choose things like how am I going to tune the cross, like the, the sort of penalties? How am I going to do the cross validation? Uh, and to my knowledge, there's no subtle question on like what kind of cross validation is better, right? So I was just talking to Dean Carlin the other week, and I was we're trying to use machine learning on a new project, and I was like, well, so I want to use Bayesian priors, but I also want to do some frequentist cross-validation just to check that I'm not getting kind of too crazy results. Um, and a lot of the kind of automatic cross-validation that's done is leave one out cross-validation. Um, and Dean was immediately saying, what, leave one out? Like, no, 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 I, you know, if, if we're trying to estimate variances, leaving one out, that's not useful. We've got to leave like a chunk out. And I was like, yeah, but now we have to figure out how big the chunk is, right? Uh, and it, you will get different results with different sizes of bins in the k-fold cross-validation. You will get different results, um, especially if you have a small data set. And in practice, what does a small data set mean? It means I'm asking a lot of the data I have. You could have 100,000 data points, but if you're asking a really complicated question, you've got a small data set. Uh, and so I, I don't think that machine learning methods are going to get rid of this problem at all. I just think it moves it one level up. How am I going to find the specification that I end up using? I need to pre-register that. Yeah. Any other like plugs or benefits people want to? There's one in the back. Yeah, absolutely. So that is very challenging when you can't release the data um, because it's proprietary or, or there's some, oh, I, did somebody, I heard like a murmur that maybe someone has experience with this. This is not experience that I have because uh, I work with all public data sets. Um, I think that's the case where, you know, we give you a free pass. We say like if it's, you know, if you really can't release this data, there's nothing we can do about it. Um, however, what you can do is pre-register at a broader level the kind of methodology you're interested in using and the broad principles that you're going to use, and then you can release your code, right? So you release your code without the data, and then I can go through your code and see, okay, yeah, he did actually specify this kind of inclusion restriction, and then he did, you know, combine the data across the different tables in this way, you know, and so even if you can't release the, the data, people do, you know, people can see what you're doing if you release the code. And if you have a pre-analysis plan for how you're going to kind of, you know, uh, combine those data sets as you were talking about. Yeah. What's nice about proprietary data is usually you've got a record of when you got it. So you really can do a pre-analysis plan before you get it. Uh, so it's like the flip side, right? Like for me, none of you know when I downloaded the data. I'm trying to do the best I can by being honest about it, but like you can't verify it. With the case that you talked about, you know, you can verify when you got it. Now, the flip side of that is you can see the data that I use. That's online. You can look at my cleaning file and the raw data and see what I did to it. And when the data is proprietary, you can't do that. So there's there's trade-offs with those. There was another, yeah? yeah we, uh, actually, you said it is possible to, to, to pre-register to, to pre uh, studies with uh, data 
Yes. What if, for instance, in your pre analysis plan, since it is a sort of a skeleton, you describe everything. And then uh, when you when when you have the database, in the questionnaires you have the, those data. And for instance, when, when when you have the data, you cannot find those uh, data. Especially mm -hmm. when you are dealing with the uh, instrumental variables. Yep. So how do you uh, how do you solve that problem? Yeah, so unfortunately, you know, that, that kind of thing happens not infrequently. And again, I think it's just a case of you, because you have this pre-analysis plan where you said you were going to do this, you now have to explain to your reader or your client or whoever, like, we couldn't do it because the data was missing. Uh, and, you know, at that point, that opens up that conversation for people to understand, like, okay, given that that data is missing, you know, and given that you can't brush that under the rug because initially this was going to be a big focus of what you were doing, now I need to recontextualize how seriously, you know, how much I trust the results um, and also think more, more kind of seriously going forward about well, how are we going to make sure our data is not missing in the future and similar things. So unfortunately, it's one of those cases where uh, there's probably no immediate solution other than just disclosing it and talking about it and doing the best you can. Um, but I think, you know, this is an example of how pre-registration changes norms going forward in terms of what we think of as serious problems, right? So missing data is actually a serious problem in social science. Uh, you know, incomplete data sets that then require you to like use a very small subset of the data you could actually use, uh, and you think that that's probably selected in some way, and yet people are using methods just like dropping the incomplete data, or they're putting dummy variables in for when a method is missing, which is actually almost no different to dropping uh, so it, there's a misconception that putting dummy variables in from missing variables is like better than dropping. There's like a cup, a handful of cases where it's better than dropping. In general, it's not. It's no better. There's like you can't get around non-random missingness. Um, so you know, if we were forced to talk more about that, and pre-analysis funds would be one way that we would be forced to talk about that, then maybe we'd reorient towards solving that problem and, and data quality is a priority, rather than you know sort of things that seem more exciting further down the pipeline, but as you say, you know, if you don't have the data, you can't do the core analysis that you're interested in. So, yeah, unfortunately, that's one of those, uh, it's bad for the individual now, but hopefully with pre-analysis plans, it's going to get better in the future. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I do kind of methodological work, and so a lot of that is about implicitly about weighting studies, although you don't necessarily have to think about it in that framework. You can think about it purely in terms of like trying to detect generalizable evidence, and that then implies a set of weights. Um, so I did pre-register. I'm going to use a methodology called Bayesian hierarchical modeling. I'm going to use this sort of structure. Uh, that entails a set of weights, and I did not deviate from that. Uh, I had no intention of deviating from that. Um, what I left kind of vague in my plan is like the specific functional form that I was going to use uh, for the data was going to be determined by the shape of the data. Uh, but as long as I was sort of clear about that, and I didn't say I'm going to use this functional form, where there were cases where I wasn't going to allow it to be determined by the shape of the data, I said what I was going to do uh, using, you know, primarily Gaussian distributions. But, you know, you can absolutely leave parts of the pre-analysis plan vague like that and say I'm going to do machine learning or I'm going to do a test of goodness of fit. As long as what you then do matches what you said you were going to do or you have a good reason for why you didn't, I think, you know, that is helpful overall. Yeah. I was wondering if you treat, like, primary studies that are exploratory differently in your meta-analysis. So in my meta-analysis, I didn't have any exploratory primary studies because the microcredit literature is, like, quite special in the sense that there was a lot of observational evidence and a lot of, you know, uh, NGOs doing their own trials that sort of suggested that maybe microcredit would have a lot of impact. And then... Uh, the randomistas kind of came in and said, we're going to do a bunch of randomized trials. And in my meta-analysis, I just said, let's just consider the randomized trials, right? So we know that those randomized trials were intended to be confirmatory, right? Is it the case that the buzz that we're seeing about microcredit is, is real or not, right? Um, 
There's other aspects of the randomized trials where they then went in and sort of looked more at details or at heterogeneous treatment effects. Um, and when we were doing that, I sort of separated that out into a separate paper. Uh, so, it, you know, there's sort of one paper where we're saying, let's just look at the, you know, what we expected to see was this, did we see it? Uh, and then another paper where we say, we need to think about heterogeneous treatment effects, how are we thinking about it? That's inherently kind of a more exploratory uh, approach, but it's not the case that certain papers, certain RCTs were exploratory and certain were confirmatory. It's, you know, there is this kind of sense of we're trying to test whether microcredit helps people or not, defined in this specific way that we've decided beforehand, and we stuck with that. Um, and then after that, we started thinking, okay, maybe it helps some people and not others. How would we actually aggregate evidence about who it helps, who it hurts, whether it helps or hurts people? So yeah, it, it didn't come up in that early stage, but it kind of came up down the road. All right, let's kind of move on a little bit because I think we're, we're kind of foreshadowing stuff that I'll talk about later, so then maybe we'll go a bit faster. So this is actually what we've been talking about a little bit. Uh, this, this concern that I see arising a lot is will pre-registration stifle creativity and limit the discoveries from exploratory analysis? It is absolutely true that many, uh, perhaps most important scientific discoveries in the natural sciences and in social sciences come from unexpected discoveries, right? They're not, it's not the case that somebody says like, I bet like copper is a really good conductor. I'm gonna test that. Yes, it is, done. Like it takes 10 years to figure out what's a good conductor for what, you know. You know, a lot of science is exploratory and there's a lot of engineering that's kind of, and I don't know if you guys have ever met engineers, but they do not do confirmatory analysis. They are out there like, I'm putting all this stuff in a box, like what's gonna happen? So. This is real and we don't want to stifle that, right? That's a beautiful part of, of scientific discovery. Uh, however, when you're doing that, that is not the analysis framework that null hypothesis significance testing is designed to go with, right? It's designed to go with confirmatory analysis. And you know the kind of conditioning on data that you have in a Bayesian framework, again, implies that the data that you have is fixed. If you could go back and get more data or throw more things in the box, then actually the data you have is different than what you're conditioning on and you're no longer doing a legitimate Bayesian procedure. So the problems express themselves differently in the two frameworks, but they, they are there in both. When you are doing that, I'm looking for what works, that engineering kind of attitude, you're searching. That's great because that's what you're supposed to be doing in that framework, but when you then apply null hypothesis significance testing, that's not what you were supposed to be doing. Um, so surprising findings need to be contextualized as such. Now whether that's with pre-analysis plans or whether that's with, you know, pre-registering your prior if you're a Bayesian, saying I expected copper to be a great conductor or I expected, you know, glue to be a great conductor and I learned a lot about electricity today, then, you know, that's going to contextualize what we're finding. Uh, and so pre-specification is not intended to disparage exploratory analysis but to free it from the tradition of being portrayed as formal hypothesis testing. And I think that comes back to that general point of trying to pretend that we're doing this like objective, like the hypotheses come down from the stone tablet on the mountain and I just test them, I'm just an objective functionary of science. That's not really how science works and we need to be kind of communicating more accurately with each other and with the public uh, so that we are appropriately cautious about what we're finding. Okay, so here's kind of what we've been subtly talking about the whole time, which is really important in my life. How widely can pre-specification be applied? This is a major open intellectual question, right? There are people who just absolutely are not interested in seeing a pre-analysis plan if you already have the data on your computer, right? And that's a totally defensible position because those guys are worried about malicious intent, right? And, and catching people who are intentionally doing the wrong thing because, you know, they got paid by somebody to do it or you know, too many years in the basement at a research university makes you do strange things. Uh, but, you know, I think there's, there's another aspect, there's another side, and, and I kind of come down on that side, which says that you can pre-register pretty much anything, and it forces you to be concrete about what you're thinking before you go in and start actually doing the analysis. So obviously, kind of in that framework, you can, you can always pre-register a laboratory experiment, right? And pre-analysis plans could be really important here because it's really cheap once you have a lab set up to run multiple experiments. You know, in behavioral economics, and I'm sure this is true in psychology and sociology, although those are not my areas, 
you know, you're recruiting 50 undergrads and you're paying them money to play a dictator game or to, you know, type in a computer and if they're the fastest, then they get to give an electric shock to their roommate or something. You know, there's always 50 undergrads who want to give an electric shock to their roommate. So if you don't like what you found, you can always just run another one and it costs you, you know, $50 million to build the lab, but now the lab's there. So it's really low, co the marginal cost of doing another experiment when you found something that you didn't like or you can't explain or you can't sell to an editor of a journal, you know, is, is really low. And that is going to be, I think, one of, the, one of the key concerns for behavioral economists, psychologists. And this would be an area where there's going to be a bigger replication crisis, right? Like the cheaper it is to do experiments, the worse the replication crisis is going to be unless you've got pre-analysis plans, right? then people are always going to have a track record of like, oh, actually, you know, Professor X ran 500 experiments and 498 of them did not find that people love to give electric shocks to their roommates, but two of them did, and so now he's got like an exploratory study and then a confirmatory study. So, you know, you want to, you want to prevent that. And registering in a public registry, you know, all the trials you're doing is going to make sure that the ones that didn't work are going to be out there, everyone's going to know about it. That really seems like low-hanging fruit. I don't think there's, you know, I've never seen somebody object to this. Of course, you can still have the issues where you specify, you know, a dumb functional form, but that's pretty minor, right? Like, pe people are very forgiving, as I've said, of like, you know, putting a graph up or saying, look, look at the scatter plot. I chose the wrong functional form. Here's a functional form that works better. You can see both. So you're kind of empowered to make up your own mind. People are very chill about that. Um, I mean, the other thing about lab experiments is that if they're low cost to do, they're sort of low cost to replicate. This was a point that's been made by other people before. I think, so some people have pointed out that, oh, therefore, why would you need a pre-analysis plan? Because anyone can replicate your, your results. I don't think that's true because, like, yeah, once you have a lab, you can do heaps, but not every university has a lab that can do research on undergrads. Um, you know, maybe in psychology they do, but in, in economics that's not true, right? Like, you know, there's big labs at certain universities that are set up with the infrastructure, and there's other universities that just don't have that infrastructure. Like, to my knowledge, you know, I did my PhD at MIT. We didn't have, like, a big behavioral economics research lab um, where we were running heaps of experiments. It's just not something that we had. So we could never check that John List at Chicago, you know, it, it, you know is finding real effects. Only his Chicago colleagues could check that. So then you've got a kind of a clustering problem. So I think pre-analysis plans are still the way to go, still the best way to track people. What are they doing? What did they expect to find? How many experiments did they do? That, I think, is like pretty uncontroversial. So prospective observational non-experimental studies are you know, also pretty popular to pre-register. It is hard, um, but you know, especially in cases where uh, you know, the you're sort of the policy change hasn't happened yet, right? So, so I have a I had a classmate back at MIT, Gabriel Kreindler, uh, who's doing really interesting work on policy to um, reduce congestion in cities in India, um, and they found out that the Indian government was going to change the congestion pricing or, or introduce congestion pricing in a certain way, and they just right away pre-registered like we're going to do a study on this, uh, and here's what we're going to look for, and here's how we're going to collect the data. Now, obviously, you know. He, he had to change some of the details of what he was doing when he got to, uh, I think he's in Bangalore. He's going to kill me if he finds out. I can't remember which city he's in. Uh, I think he's in Bangalore. Uh, you know, when you're saying I'm going to survey people in Bangalore by hanging out at a gas station, that seems like a good idea at the time. Uh, might Maybe not a good idea in practice. I think he had to change a little bit how he was doing it. That's fine. Nobody, nobody's arguing that because you had that idea about surveying, you can't change it. Piloting is all about figuring out what is working on the ground. You know, but you absolutely can say, we're going to pilot, and these are the kind of ideas we're going to pilot. And then of these ideas, what's going to work? Uh, and then, we'll, then we'll do that. Um, so in fact, the first pre-analysis plan in economics, as far as I know, and I checked this with Ted, so as far as Ted, Miguel, and I know, was Newmark, uh, who planned to study the effect of future minimum wage increases on unemployment. Right, so this is an example where there's just no way this person could have the data. It's not an experiment, right? But the policy change hasn't happened when this guy, you know, sends the letter to the head of the department. Oh, they had the internet then. When he sent the email to the head of the department uh, that said, I'm going to study this, or, you know, now you'd be able to put it on the, on the registry. 
Uh, so, and we'll discuss that a little bit more later. Um, as I was saying before, pre-registration can also be used when new rounds of data are released. Um, or where access to existing data is restricted, like we we're talking about before, if the data is proprietary, if a company has the data on their servers and they don't release it publicly, then the date on which you receive the data is verifiable, right? You just ask the company, or in some cases, they've got logs of all the terminals, right? Like if you've got a Bloomberg terminal, we know the date on which you got it, we know the date on which you accessed it. So, you know, companies are tracking these things and so we can check that. Uh, you know, this I think accounts for some quantitative empirical work. It is also true that like quite often you're kind of, you know, looking at things that happened in the past and saying, oh, they did do a minimum wage hike or they did, you know, do the Mariel boat lift in Florida. So, you know, I'm not sure what kind of percentage of, of, of the actual total work this is, but it certainly happens and it's, I think it's pretty clear that that's beneficial. Um, and the open science framework, again, as I've been saying, provides a really flexible platform for, for time stamping the plans that you have at whatever level you have them. Um, yeah, so we'll kind of go into that a little bit more later. Um, but if you're not doing, you know, sort of micro empirical studies, right, where you're saying, oh, someone's going to change this one policy lever, if you're interested in macroeconomics, um, you can still pre-register, right? This is more controversial. This kind of gets into the realm of registering meta-analyses where, you know, the government already releases all the macro data, right? And it's totally freely available. And you probably used it in, you know, macroeconomists use the same data all the time, right? So they've used it in previous projects. There's just no sense in which they can make this decision before they see the data because there's only one American economy and for some reason macroeconomists are only interested in the American economy and so they've been studying that their whole lives. And so, you know, that they already are very intimately familiar with the data in a similar way or, or actually more so than I was, say, with the microcredit data, right? So I had never used the microcredit data before when I first started doing the meta-analyses, but I'd read the studies, right? And by the time I came to do heter my heterogeneous effects work, I had worked with the data to just to look at the average treatment effect. So that's kind of similar to the situation a macroeconomist would be in, where he's done work and he's always looking at inflation and wages and unemployment and that sort of stuff. But now, you know, he's interested in something different uh, and he wants to think about something new, but he wants to make sure that he doesn't specification search or, you know, search over models or something. So he could actually specify ex ante the parameters that he's going to use in calibrations. Um, the, the sort of style of model that he's going to use, um, uh, particularly in structural estimation. So I believe that, uh, that uh, Gia actually did um, pre-register the model that was going to be used in the industrial organization work. That is like quite, that's quite detailed. Like that's really a kind of a gold star example. And that's kind of easier to do if you're working in uh, a field like industrial organization or macro where there's canonical models. So you're always kind of planning to use these canonical models, but maybe there's five canonical models you could choose from. And so what, what pre-registration would do is just force you to think a little bit beforehand about which of those models really make sense for your context. And again, if you get it wrong, people I think are quite forgiving about that as long as you know, you're explaining what you're doing. Um, and that kind of starts the conversation that maybe could lead us to valuing those sorts of uh, specification choices more in economics, right? The fact that we don't talk about this stuff because we don't have to pre-register at the moment, um, you know, means that things like specification choice are poorly understood and not seen as important. Whereas, you know, they probably are very important and should be better understood. So that's another thing that pre-registration is going to bring as it becomes more popular, we hope. The other thing that's really useful is to just pre-specify prior distributions when you're doing Bayesian analysis. This is hard when you're doing methodologically innovative stuff because you're not sure what the model is going to look like. You're not sure what the likelihood is going to look like yet, right? Um, however, you can spec if you do know what your likelihood is going to look like, you can pre-specify priors. You can also pre-specify like the way that you're going to choose the priors once you have the likelihood. Um, so you know, in my case, I was building hierarchical models. I didn't know what kind of functional form on the likelihood I was going to use but I knew I was going to have multiple levels in the model. Uh, and Andrew Gelman's done a lot of work on what kind of prior functional forms are useful for the parameters that live at the upper level of the model. So just put in the pre-registration, I'm going to follow Andrew Gelman's research and choose the prize that he recommends. 
you know, so you kind of have a choice of the scaling, but the functional form of the prior is kind of pre-specified. Ted, I think, is a big fan of saying we, we're going to go Bayesian if we could el elicit expert opinion priors. Um, that could be something where we're going. The statistics literature is more about saying, you know, what kind of priors make sense given the kinds of problems that models tend to run into when we fit them to data. So what kind of priors prevent this kind of overfitting that might happen in certain models? So there's, there's multiple you know, ways you could get your prior, but you could definitely pre-register what your prior is or how you're going to choose it. So another thing you could do uh, is if you're really worried about people scooping your research idea or, you know, you don't want, um, you don't want to be in a situation where you're releasing your plan, but you know that the data is going to be kind of not available for a while, um, then you can put it up there, freeze it, but then only have it published later, right? So that's stamped with the right date on the website, um, but it's not visible until even years later because you don't want people to scoop what you're working on or the data is not available anyway. Um, so that's another option if people are worried about that. So just to go back to, in our last 15 minutes, what we're talking about before, um, the Newmark pre-analysis plan uh, was a case where they sort of had already been studying these, these kinds of questions of the minimum wage, and they knew there was going to be a change in the minimum wage. And before that happened, yep. Mm -hmm. You know, the macroeconomics has a, it has a particularity of the methodology used, which is contingent by the, by the nature of the data. I think, for instance, in time series, when you want, you want to run a regression, mm -hmm. the, 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 there are certain conditions in which, uh, that, for instance, uh, unit would you need some unit yep. test before. Yep. So, do you, do you mean that uh, when, why uh, pre registering you need to give details? The, the, based on the nature of, of the data, it may be variables are stationary. Mm. So, uh, go on. So, the, yeah. so, so it's quite correct for you to specify that if we have stationary data, mm -hmm. we use ordinary time series. If mm -hmm. we have maybe non-stationary, mm -hmm. we use error correction models mm -hmm. or progressive. So, it is quite correct specifying that. So you absolutely can, and that would be, you know, frankly, an incredible amount of detail. Um, it's not, so that is a concern with time series data and with macro. Uh, it's a bit of a misconception that that's not true in other types of data. That's absolutely true in the cross-section. Not unit roots, but if your data is very, very fat-tailed, so it turns out that profit data in the microcredit trials is incredibly heavy-tailed. So some people who are just 100 or 500 or 1,000 times more profitable or more productive than other people. Um, then, like, classical statistics is going to really be uh, less reliable than you would hope. Uh, and there's cases where if the tails are very, very fat, it really doesn't make sense to compute an average at all. Uh, you should be working entirely with medians at that point. So you could always say, uh, I'm going to test for fat tails, and then I'm going to use medians, or I'm going to use means, if not. Um, but I think this is a case, this will be a kind of case where people understand that there's an issue, and you know it's sort of fine to say, I said I was going to do mean regression. It turns out this thing has super, super fat tails, or there's a unit root. I have to change what I'm doing. So it's great to specify it beforehand, as you were saying, that kind of contingent plan. Um, but I don't want researchers to get the message that that's what they have to do or that's what they're expected to do. This is the kind of case where it's totally fine for you to say, OK, the plan that we had assumed there would not be a unit root in the, rec in the, in the time series, there is a unit root. It's clearly not going to work. That would be uncontroversial. So I think that would be fine. Yeah, but it's a great point. Um, OK, so just to quickly go back to this, um, you know, so, so I, we think this is the first pre-analysis plan ever done in economics. It wasn't a laboratory trial. It wasn't an RCT. It was just a forecasted policy change. Um, and some of the sort of results that they had from recent studies, because they started with a sort of meta-analytic framework of recent studies, was, you know, there's, there's potentially quite a lot of uh, variation in the estimated effects, and so they had to think carefully about the methodology, and they wanted to do that before they had the data to prevent themselves from searching, right? So this wasn't expected of them. They just thought, 
you know, this is really a case where the kind of methodology we choose could matter. I want to make sure that I'm not searching in a way that's really harmful to the scientific process. Um, so what they actually did is they submitted a detailed analysis plan to a journal before the government released the statistics. Um, they had got referee reports before they even re received the data, getting feedback on their pre-analysis plan, essentially. Um, and so they themselves, you know, this is a quote from them, they wanted to be free of author effects in their analysis. They wanted to understand that they had researcher degrees of freedom and try to mitigate that problem as much as they could. That was why off their own bat they sort of tried to do this. Um, and this is kind of similar to the Daniel Kahneman's idea of adversarial collaboration, where you work with somebody who has a different prior to you, and so you can't just search to look to confirm your prior because the person sitting next to you believes something different. Um, it's quite close to something called a registered report that I understand is used in psychology to some extent, where a journal can accept uh, a paper just based on the plan, based on it's an interesting enough question, it's a credible research design, no matter what you see, we're going to publish it, that's going to eliminate the file drawer problem, right? So that would be amazing. I don't know if this is like realistic for general cases, but certainly there's going to be times when this makes sense. So it's just a case of instead of having peer review just before you publish, after you've done everything, you have peer review when you design it. Uh, when you design the study, when you design the experiment, uh, you know, that could be one way that we go forward. This is what these guys did. Um, so an interesting point here is that, you know, actually what came up before is there's this trade-off, right? They wanted to tie their hands, but they didn't want to prevent themselves using an appropriate statistical model. So these problems that we're discussing have been here from the beginning. Um, you know, choosing a model is difficult. No, no one is saying that we should be able to foresee exactly what's going to be in the data. Um, now, in this case, and in cases where you're dealing with an established question, where there's many, many studies, it's kind of easy to know, to a large extent, what you're going to see, what the data shape is going to be. Um, it does depend a little bit on, you know, the more innovative the work is, the more challenging it is to write a pre-analysis plan. Um, and again, I would just say, just go higher levels. Just write broadly, I will tackle these kinds of problems in these kinds of ways. So, you know, in such a research area, there is kind of less uh, chance to data mine anyway, um, and so I think that is kind of why uh, in exploratory work, although as we were saying it's harder to do these pre-analysis plans, it is really valuable because this is an area where no one kind of knows what's going to happen. It's really easy to convince yourself ex post that you expected what you saw. So I mean, what these guys found is actually there were no, no statistically significant effects and the magnitudes were small. Um, you know, this was sort of People really thought from economic theory that minimum wage changes would change unemployment, and that's not what they found, given the analysis that they committed to do. Uh, there's a little bit more kind of issues in, in terms of the trade-off between specification choices. I'm going to push on a little bit just because we're kind of lacking in time. Um, so one of, the, one of the issues that we sort of flagged before is when you get the data, you have this plan, and then you find out that your data is very noisy, that inherently leads you to think, I need to change my strategy because I don't have a lot of precision. You know, and that makes sense on the one hand, but as we were saying before, there's this trade-off where like, if you had seen something and you hadn't had noisy data, you wouldn't do that next analysis. And so actually the p-values you're constructing are, are not right. Um, so yes, uh, you know, I, I think there are many potential social science applications of you know, that kind of situation where you've got a public release of new data, new follow-ups in randomized trials, um, and, and that sort of structure. It doesn't have to just be laboratory reports. Um, so this is sort of even more controversial, and we've been talking about that a little bit, so just to wrap up, uh, with observational studies, the most controversial area. Um, most studies are observational studies, so we better get this right. So we want to improve transparency practices in a case where you know, you really can't check that somebody really wrote the pre-analysis plan before they got the data, and often they, they don't. Uh, and some people in epidemiology really think that you shouldn't register observational studies. Uh, I'm going to disagree with this. Uh, Del Rey et al. in 2014 wrote a paper disagreeing with this. Uh, and they had three, or yeah, three arguments saying, you know, if you have IRB approval for your observational 
data. And yes, you do need the IRB approval to work with data, even though it's already being collected uh, by governments or by NGOs. Then it doesn't cost you that much to pre-register because you have to say to IRB what you're going to do with the data anyway. Um, it makes all of the evidence that you have much more visible to other scholars. It does prevent the file drawer problem in observational studies. That's still a problem in observational studies. It's still useful to have that. Um, it could increase the publication of null findings if this becomes more and more of a norm. Um, obviously, there's no way to verify that registration precedes analysis. We talked about that. Um, there's the scooping issue. I think we could work out a pretty sensible norm where if you post the registration first, it's your idea and people won't work on it. I mean, scoop. no one wants to scoop someone else. It's just a messy situation. Uh, again, you know, if someone's malicious and searching through and trying to scoop people, uh, there's not a lot you can do, like a pre-analysis, like, you know, and so that could be a case where if you really think that you've got a bad equilibrium in your discipline and there are malicious people, then you want to, like, freeze the pre-analysis plan. Uh, so let's just hold questions to the end, so, yeah, because we only got five more minutes. Um, we want to freeze that pre-analysis plan and only release it afterwards, and, but that, you know, has the same effect uh, overall. Um, yeah, so this could lead to greater data sharing, as we've been saying, um, you know, releasing the log files of your analysis, releasing the code that you wrote. Um, I, for example, put all of the code that I wrote and used for my projects up on a public Git repository. Um, so that's something you can do. Uh, again, it's going to rely on the honor system when people are posting data and code. Is that the code they actually used? You know, how are we going to verify that? Um, I actually think it would be cool if uh, foundations would endow prizes for the best researcher data sets or the best code banks. Um, I think that would be a way to really strongly enforce norms that like we value this, this is a core part of transparency, so uh, that could be some idea. We could also call out bad public data sets. I don't know, that seems a bit negative. Uh, so registering meta studies is something that I've talked about. Uh, throughout this, uh, it really does rely on researcher good faith, um, but I do think that if you are engaging with the research in good faith, pre-analysis and pre-registration plans really help you, prevent you from searching across outcomes and specifications, which you can do subconsciously, right? Like you just convince yourself that, you know, you never thought that such a stupid idea would be right and actually, you know, you always plan to do this or that, you know, this, this or that analysis. We're all human, we're, we're victim to that. I think, you know, in my experience, the value of pre-registration is really that it knocks that on the head. You can't escape what it is that you thought when you started the project, which is usually quite different to what you think at the end. Um, so if you're doing a meta-study and you want to do it well, I think pre-registration really helps and it stops you from changing the game on yourself. Um, it helps you appropriately contextualize your results given what you believed before you saw the data or before you did this analysis. So it is unorthodox to register meta-analyses and other observational studies, but I do think it is potentially helpful for researchers with good intentions. It is not a solution to the problem of evil. I will let you guys know when we solve the problem of evil, uh, but at the moment, it's not going to do that. Uh, but I, I really hope that what you take away from this is that anything that you can write down and make public before you do it is going to be really helpful to the community moving all of us forward in terms of research transparency norms but also to yourself when you come back to write up your results to remind yourself what you really did believe before you saw the data because it's often really different to what you tell yourself that you believed after you saw it so if you want more information uh, you can check out the materials on our on the bits website um, and there is like going to be a massive open online course about uh, open social science research um, and of course, if you have any more questions, uh, you can just come and talk to me afterwards. I won't be around for long, but I will be around for a little. So thank you so much. OK, I think we have a break now. Is that right? Yeah, yeah coffee yeah, break. Yeah, the yeah if there's, oh, there's like a yeah, brief window. There was a question back there before. Right, absolutely. So it just helps because you can go to the registry and see all these trials that were done that then didn't show up in journals and aren't on people's websites. 
Uh, and so from that, or someone who does meta research like me can actually go through and like scrape that database and say, these are the kinds of trials that never get published. These are the kinds of trials that are susceptible to the file drawer problem. That would be super valuable like, for, for people who do meta research. And especially because the AEA registry forces you to put all these things in, like the time from baseline to end line, uh, you know, what kind of research design. So then you could start to understand what kind of research designs produce this file drawer problem or are susceptible to it. So I think that's like the key advantage. Um, yeah, but I, I, there must be kind of other personal advantages that we talked about as well. Yeah, yep. So it doesn't, um, but it's. Uh, I wouldn't do a bun for any correction to get kind of nerdy <laughs> to get kind of nerdy on you. Uh, I would do some other kind of, of multiple correction, um, but it does reduce the problem, right? So like a bun for any correction on the set of hypotheses that you're showing me is one thing, <coughs> or or you know a Benjamin Hochberg correction on the set of hypotheses you're showing me. Um, but what it will, you know, what I can't do is a correction on the hypotheses I never show you. Right? And so that's where the pre-analysis plan comes in and says, you know, you guys are doing your Benjamini Hochberg correction on these 10 hypotheses. You should be doing it on the 20 hypotheses that you actually specified. So it doesn't excuse you within the framework. Uh, you know, like within a single regression, right? You might have 40 coefficients if you're running, you know, and you need to do the correction on those. Um, but it definitely helps you, it excuses you from an additional correction you have to do across regressions. Uh, in that kind of sense. So, you know, because we know the number of regressions and so we know the right correction. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. I just wondered whether you see the scope for a movement for post registration plans as well. Because um, you gave the example of Ted Miguel's paper mm -hmm. that did work out as mm. they planned. And this is explained partly in the paper, but um, articles have a limited word count and you can write everything within the paper. And I just wondered whether it's would be easier then to have post like post analysis plans where everything is detailed and compared to what you had initially set out to do with them. Yeah, so I wouldn't call that a plan mm -hmm. uh, because a plan is like what yes. I'm going to do, right? But mm -hmm. uh, you could definitely do like a post analysis kind of, uh, you know, a report uh, and put that in the appendix or, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. So I would think that's very interesting and certainly for controversial papers, I, you know, there are times when I would have absolutely clicked on that appendix and read it. Um, my suspicion is that, you know, in, mo in most cases, they probably wouldn't be read. But then again, you know, if these things are just supposed to be these kind of uh, checks and balances, then they only need to work in these extreme cases. So I could totally see that happening. Uh, I think first we want to get people to pre-register. That's kind of the priority. Yeah, there's a question over here. No? Sorry, yeah. So like they were like showing that the result was like good and everything, and some people started questioning them on some specific aspects. Mm -hmm. So we are doing like uh, follow up based on those critiques. Mm -hmm. So to what extent this can be considered as a PI? Because to my, I mean somehow I mean see it like trying to somehow you know prove that they were right mm -hmm. at the beginning. So how? Yeah, it's, it's a very challenging situation. This is an area, I think, where um, it's an active area of statistical research, like how exactly you should contextualize that. I think within a Bayesian framework, it's like reasonably clear, like you take the data from the previous waves of the previous trial, and you do, you know, the analysis that you have, and that informs your priors for the analysis that's coming. And so that kind of gives you a way to harmoniously uh, include the data that you previously had in a way that's very transparent. Um, I think it is more challenging in a frequentist framework to know exactly how to adjust the test for the fact that you're actually using information that you saw that comes from the same place. Um, that kind of test adjustment, I've seen um, a couple of papers about that in epidemiology, but uh, I haven't seen it in, in economics or, or uh, in psychology. Um, so I think that's an open area. Unfortunately, for now, there's no statistical consensus on how to do that in a, in a kind of frequentist framework. Um, so yeah, that's something where you sort of do the best you can and 
you know, make sure that the statisticians are kind of working on this problem to bring us the solutions that we can apply going forwards. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, I work with a lot of clients who develop um, education interventions, and some of them will say we don't want to pre-register because um, we don't want to finance that, we don't think it's necessary, and other issues they probably don't understand it. And another issue is if you get no results, they don't want to know about it and yeah. they don't want other people to know about it. So what tips do you have for me and for anyone else who wants to convince a client this is an important aspect of the research? Yeah, I guess um, you know that that's really challenging and that's not an area that I have a lot of expertise in. Um, but I guess from you know trying to convince economists to do it who, and they have the same concerns, right? Uh, so I think... Uh, one of the things is you, you can, it's a bit negative, but you can play to their anxiety, right? You say, well, everybody else is going to pre-register. Uh, and so you can, you know, you, you can be ahead of the pack and, you know, the for, at the forefront of methodology and you can sort of put uh, on your website that you guys did this like gold standard pre-registration. Um, or, you know, your competitors are going to do it and then people are going to be more impressed with their research. They're going to find that more credible. Um, so that's something that we... Uh, I guess try to say to economists when they don't want to pre-register about the cost. I don't. I mean, I think that we can put that to bed. It's not. It's not costly. Like if you're planning to do something, like and especially if you're working in a team, internal memos are being drafted about like what's going to happen, um, and so it's just kind of about cleaning that up and making that you know that there's no proprietary information that's being released. Um, you know, it it is going to be hard if we're in a climate where it's not it's not required and a lot of people are doing it. Um, you know, you try to appeal to people's better nature and you say, this is really important for us to know that we are doing the right thing. Um, and if you can't do that, then you say, hey, it's not cool, everyone else is doing it, you know. So, you know, the economist version of, of social influence is like, you know, make them feel bad about it, basically. I don't know how, uh, how useful that is, um, but hopefully, uh, you know, they're working in an NGO because they, they want to, help people and want to find out the truth and so I think you can sort of connect that back to that desire of this is how we're going to help people. Okay, I think we've run out of time. Uh, so let's give uh, Rachel one more round of applause. <laughs> and uh, we've got a coffee break now, uh, 20 some odd minutes and we'll be back at uh, 3 o'clock to hear Nicole talk about reputation.